بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رزق سستز الإسلام We as parents ultimately determine the value systems of our children. We have shown by our successes that we certainly pay attention to their future. Our children generally excel and they outpace the average American population. We do better at college. We hold better positions in industry. So all in all, we have been doing a pretty good job in preparing our children for corporate America and for life with our neighbors in suburbia. There is, however, a very important element to the future of the child that we have to pay closer attention to. And it is very perfectly encapsulated in the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, in which he says, he says, every child is born with a particular orientation. Every child has within her or within him a moral compass. Parents are thereafter responsible for pointing that moral compass in the wrong direction. And so they end up becoming Christians, Jews, and in this modern world, they end up becoming secularists. So this, therefore, is our responsibility. It's not something that a child imbibes in school. Certainly, he imbibes a set of values, which we'll talk about soon. But it's not our values. It's not something that can be given to a child by way of the internet. You can't have a crash course in morality and ethics. It's something that seeps into one's character and one's personality throughout this long journey that we call life. And we neglect that to our detriment. The world in which we find ourselves comp comprises of three ethical or moral orientations. There is this egoism which is quite rampant and it is a philosophy a way of determining your future actions and it is respected and it goes like this that any individual who focuses entirely on himself or herself on that which is of benefit to himself or herself will have a positive effect in the long run on society as a whole. So every act you action you take, you do so with yourself in mind. Kind of deep self-centeredness. A deep self-centeredness. This is something that exists around us, but we perhaps are not able to recognize it. As parents, we fail for the reasons I've mentioned previously, but we also fail because we're culturally displaced. And by that I mean the fact that many of you have actually grown up in societies where the individual is part of a whole. And it is the whole that interacts with the individual fills the life of that individual with ethics and morality. It's something you learn not just from your parents. If parents are negligent in Africa, if they're negligent in India, 
if they're negligent in Eastern Europe even, then society has a way of imbuing that child with values that are common to that society. We assume when getting on that plane to fly to the United States with our green cards in hand, that this is exactly what happens in the United States, and that is not the case. That is not the case. You cannot depend on society on instilling the values that you hold dear, that you cherish, that you value. For two reasons. One is because society is not in the business of imposing values upon individuals. And secondly, your values might be at odds with that of society. So you find on the one hand there is this individualism. On the other you have what you'd call a secular humanism. This is an entire society that is dedicated to promoting the values of secular humanism. And they have no more than 250,000 people. Yet, their way of thinking, their value system, is the dominant value system in the world today. And it states that any value with regard to one's financial obligations, with regard to one's sexual orientations, well, the merits of that value will depend on society deeming it good or science deeming it acceptable. These are the only two criteria. If science, by way of its scientific inquiry, determines that a particular act is good, then that act is ipso facto good. And if society changes, flips, takes on new values, normalizes a practice that was otherwise abnormal, you can make your own co comparisons in your mind when, as I speak. What was abnormal 20 years ago and is quite normal today. Look at sexual orientations today. The abnormal has become normal. In parts of Northern Europe, laws have, are being promulgated. I'm not certain if they're passed yet. But laws that would allow incestuous relationships. Need I say more? So that which was considered forbidden and taboo, a relationship between a brother and a sister, is now being normalized. The third way of looking at ethics and morality is through a spiritual humanism. Where three things are taken into account. One, that Allah exists. In a secular humanism, there is no place for a God. Personally, you might want to believe in a God or not believe in Him. It matters not. Ask yourself in the 30, 40 or 50 years that you've lived in this country, how often was belief or the disbelief in God a determinant, a barrier, or a promoter for your success or failure? I would argue not, not a single time. But in Islam, everything revolves around the idea that Allah exists. Everything revolves around the idea that in your, in your body, a soul exists which is connected to that Allah. And that Allah is an Allah who has, who, who instills you with a purpose. Your values come from Him, not from within yourself. Your values come from Him, not from within society. It is Allah who says, Inna Allah ya'mur bil adli wa ihsan wa ita'i dil qurba wa yanha anil fahsha. These are the three big ethical and moral teachings in Islam. They're so big that a great alim in Islam, Ezzuddin ibn Abdus Salam, dedicated an entire book 
just explaining the al-awamir al-thalath wal manhiyat al-thalath these three things that are enjoined upon you and the three things that are forbidden unto you all of these things are encapsulated in this one fantastic verse of the Quran in Allah who will let the yamur do not it is Allah alone no one except Allah who enjoins these things justice and righteousness and having a relationship with family when you ponder upon that particular verse I think every Muslim should memorize that verse this should be the basis for our ethical value system this is how we teach our children to believe and be Muslim when you ponder upon that it occurs to you that this verse is not just enjoining that I do good but I also establish the most awkward kind of relationships and perhaps the most awkward is with your siblings and your uncles and your aunts who come with so much baggage <coughs> and to that Allah says <laughs> that you have to maintain a relationship with your family Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his infinite wisdom reoriented Arab society in a, in, a, in a really nice way. So he says, Because this spiritual humanism has a tendency to go off-road. And he is cognizant of this and he says, careful, you should help your brother when he is being oppressed but also when he is the oppressor to which the companions responded we make we quite understand helping our brother when he is oppressed but how do we help him when he is an oppressor he says by preventing him from doing or engaging in that oppression this spiritual humanism it quickly descends into a spiritual communism, communism where I will turn a blind eye and if you come from certain parts of the world this would resonate with you I will turn a blind eye when someone from within my circles someone close to me crosses the line I will however apply the law to the full extent of the law when someone outside my circle this kind of favoritism this is what debases society this is what debased Arab society and it is important to understand that this verse makes no distinction between a Muslim and a non-Muslim when it says that you should you should stop someone from engaging in oppression it's not saying you should stop someone from engaging in oppressing fellow Muslims. It's okay to oppress non-Muslims. It's okay to oppress non-Muslims. That's not what the hadith is saying. The hadith is quite broad and universal. And it's our single biggest failing in the world today. We don't pay careful attention to this hadith. which says that when you stop oppression, Perhaps you should start with the oppression of yourself and those closest to you. The oppression of yourself as well as those closest to you. We should turn this thing around. And if we instill those values in our children, then inshallah, inshallah, we will be better equipping them for the challenges that this world faces, forces upon us. Alhamdulillah, and I'm coming back. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, the Lord is the one who 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 is the الله who is the one who is the one who is the one who is the one who is the يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد أبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد 
كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم في العالم انك حميد مجيد خصوصا من ذي الاصغريق ابي بكر وعثمان وعمر وعلي اللهم اغفر لهم وارحمهم وسكنهم في الجنه اللهم اغفر لها وارحمها وسكنها في الجنه اللهم اجعل قبرها روضه من رياض الجنه ولا تجعله حفرة من حفر النار ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتوب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم عباد الله اقم الصلاه